Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is, and namaste. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you with things important to me, and that I think are worthy of your attention. Any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, send them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you'd like. Uh, I just ask you, as always, that uh, if you do email me to please be a little patient about getting an answer. I'm a little slow about answering email. And to be sure to include something in the subject line, something that makes it clear this is not spam. All right, so with that, we're just going to get on with it because I'm going to start, as I always like to, whenever I possibly can, with good news. Now, this bit of good news is really an update of something I talked about a while back, but it's, it's too good not to call good news. And frankly, I'm special good about this one because I almost missed this. I almost missed this bit of news, so I'm doubly glad to be able to mention it here. I have often in the past talked about voter ID laws, these laws uh, uh, endorsed and pushed by the right wing to restrict the ability of the poor and minorities to vote by demanding voters produce forms of identification which the poor and minorities are more likely than others to lack. Well, in January, I was able to tell you that Pennsylvania's voter ID law had been struck down by a state judge as unconstitutional and that it unreasonably burdens the right to vote and the state had not been able to show any convincing reason for why it was necessary. Well, here's the good news update. On May 8th, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Space Cadet Corbett announced that his administration will not appeal the ruling. In other words... They just gave up. Now, in doing this, Corbett issued the kind of self-serving statement you'd expect. He said, oh, of course, photo ID is proper. We just need to tweak the law about getting more IDs out there, you know, blah, blah, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but the thing is, after he and his right-wing cronies in the state legislature spent nearly $7 million trying to implement and enforce this law and defend it in court, we really have reasonable cause to wonder if he's going to be ready for another fight like that. All right, so we also have some more good news from a different part of the country. The right of same-sex marriage has moved south. On Friday, May 9th, Pulaski County, that's in Arkansas, Pulaski County Circuit Judge Chris Piazza ruled that a 2004 state amendment that bans same-sex marriage is unconstitutional and violates the rights of same-sex couples. He called it an unconstitutional attempt to narrow the definition of equality and a dangerous precedent in that it excludes a minority for no rational reason. In his decision, Piazza cited the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, 1967 decision in Loving v. Virginia, a decision which struck down bans on interracial marriage. He said, quoting, It's been over 40 years since Mildred Loving was given the right to marry the person of her choice. The hatred and fears have long since vanished, and she and her husband lived full lives together. So it will be for same-sex couples. It's time to let that beacon of freedom shine brighter on all our brothers and sisters. We will be stronger for it. Now, he did not put his ruling on hold pending appeal, even though State Attorney General Justin McDaniel has said that he intends to appeal the ruling to the state Supreme Court. Thing is, though, this decision came on a Friday, a Friday afternoon. Now, normally, state uh, county clerk's offices in Arkansas are not open on weekends, but the state right now is in its early voting period for a May 20th primary, so several county clerk's offices were open. Uh, and despite that short notice, one of those offices, that of Carroll County, issued the state's first same-sex marriage license. And that couple was wed immediately after on the sidewalk outside the courthouse. Fourteen other Carroll County same-sex couples received marriage licenses the same day. Now remember, this case is going to be on appeal, so none of this is etched in stone. But it remains true that this is another blow against the empire of bigotry. And one other quick bit of news, which I did not have time, only found out about it a couple of hours before taping. Uh, a federal 
district judge has struck down Idaho's ban on same-sex marriage, arguing, as other federal district court judges have, that it's an unconstitutional ban, unconstitutional violation of the rights of same-sex couples. I'm sure I'll have more about that Idaho decision next week. And by the way, as a footnote to that, to all that, it's worth noting that Representative Louis Gohmert, the man who put the Gomer in Gomert, ran smack long into Godwin's law on the House floor on May 9th, saying that those who call the anti-same-sex marriage far-right wackos who wave the banner of Christianity as a masquerade for their bigotry, that anyone who calls such people haters are in fact subjecting those people to persecution just like the Nazis treated the Jews in the Holocaust. Quoting him, it is amazing that in the name of liberality, in the name of being tolerant, this fascist intolerance has arisen. It's exactly what we've seen throughout our history, is going back to the days of the Nazi takeover in Europe. They would call people haters, evil, and build up disdain for those people. The next came, let's bring every book they've written, or, that's, or that has to do with them, and let's start burning the books. What's more, Gomert said, people like him are just upholding Judeo-Christian values, and they don't hate anybody. <laughs> yeah, of course that's true. You don't hate those of the LGBT community. You don't hate them. You just think they're filthy, perverted scum who don't deserve the same rights as normal people and who are condemned to everlasting torment in the unending fires of hell. But <laughs> you don't hate them. Bottom line is, according to Representative Gomer, if you call a bigot a bigot or a hater or a, ha a hater, you're a fascist and a Nazi, just two steps short of burning books and, I suppose, building gas chambers. Did you ever come across a group of people who more readily, eagerly, and persistently played the victim card than American right-wingers? All right, we're going on from there to one of our regular weekly features. It's the outrage of the week. Now, I did not mean to be talking about this topic again. As I've said before, it's not high on my personal list of political and social priorities, but it just seems to keep coming up. This week, the source of the outrage is the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, which ruled on May 9th that reciting the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools does not violate the rights of atheists, despite containing the words, under God. The case arose in 2010 when an atheist family in Acton filed the suit, asserting the, that the daily recitation of the pledge in classrooms violated the First Amendment rights of the couple's three children. Now, the thing is, the real outrage here is not so much the decision itself. I mean, the court could have said, for example, that, well, yeah, we agree it's a violation, but it's such a minor violation that it doesn't really rise to the level of constitutional concern. Now, I would have uh, been against that decision. I would have been disappointed in it, but it would not have seemed like such a big deal to me. No, the outrage here is the logic the court used in reaching its decision. It said, quoting, Although the words under God undeniably have a religious tinge, the pledge, notwithstanding its reference to God, is a fundamentally patriotic exercise, not a religious one. That is, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts has declared that the phrase under God has nothing to do with religion. Expect, except to have a religious tinge, in the same way I expect that the phrase out of touch, disconnected, historically ignorant, black robe jackasses has an uncomplimentary tinge. The thing is, of course, under God is a religious expression. That was the purpose of including it. Here's a very quick history of the Pledge of Allegiance. The original pledge was written in August of 1892 by a Baptist minister and socialist named Francis Bellamy. It was published the following month in a magazine called The Youth's Companion. It read, in full, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bellamy had actually considered including the word equality in his pledge, but he didn't because he know, knew that the various officials he worked with in various states trying to get the, the pledge uh, used, um, that they were opposed to equality for women and African Americans. 
All right, the next change came in 1923 when the National Flag Conference changed the words my flag to the flag of the United States of America, a change Bellamy, Bellamy opposed to no avail. In 1942, Congress officially recognized the Pledge of Allegiance. The change we're concerned about, though, didn't happen until 1954. That's when the phrase, under God, was inserted by Congress into the official wording. Now, the idea to do this had been kicking around for two or three years. But in February 1954, one George Dougherty preached a sermon attended by President Eisenhower, in which he said that the characteristic and definitive factor in the American way of life was missing from the pledge because, lacking any mention of God, I could hear little Muscovites repeat a similar pledge to their hammer and sickle flag in Moscow. When Eisenhower enthusiastically endorsed this sermon, that provided the political impetus to get the thing passed. On signing the bill into law, Eisenhower said, and I'm quoting him, from this day forward, the millions of our school children will daily proclaim in every city and town, every village and rural schoolhouse, the dedication of our nation and our people to the Almighty. In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace and war. That is, the phrase under God was avowedly and consciously added to contrast the religious United States with the atheistic Soviet Union. Oh, and by the way, what group spearheaded uh, uh, the campaign for the change? What group initiated it? The Knights of Columbus. But oh, no, no, under God has nothing to do with religion. Nothing at all. It's merely a patriotic exercise. Which in, which in its own way actually makes this worse. Because the clear meaning of that, the, the undeniable meaning of that, the... the, 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 the uh, the only rational interpretation of that is that part of being patriotic is believing in God. So that if you don't believe in God, you can't be truly patriotic. You can't be truly American. You can't truly be one of us. And you also have to remember this dismissal, this limitation of who gets to be a true American, who gets to be truly part of us, doesn't just apply to atheists. It applies to any religious belief that is non-theistic. It would apply to Buddhists. It would apply to Jainists. It would apply to some Hindus. It would, it would apply to animists, to members of the ethical culture movement, to followers of some Native American beliefs, even potentially to agnostics. If under God, as part of the Pledge of Allegiance, is truly nothing more than a patriotic exercise, none of those people can be said to be truly American, truly part of the American community, truly able to pledge their allegiance. Now, if that notion sounds absurd, and it is, then under God is what it plainly is, a declaration of religious conviction, and therefore a violation of the rights of those expected to recite it. And that, particularly the court's culturally blinkered, historically ignorant uh, denial of that fact, is an outrage. And there is here, again, a footnote. In its decision, the Supreme Judicial Court also made a point of saying that reciting the Pledge of Allegiance is voluntary, that students are free to recite the pledge or any part of it that they see fit, or they can choose to abstain. Which is true, the Supreme Court actually ruled that way all the way back in 1943. Or I should say, it's true legally. Socially is a different story. I mean, seriously, how many school children genuinely feel free to not do something all their classmates and their teacher are doing? And if you question that, if you question that sense of social coercion, I'm going to ask you this. Meetings of the Board of Selectmen here in town start with the Pledge of Allegiance. How comfortable would you, as a fully grown adult, how free would you feel to sit in the audience there and not stand up when everybody around you is standing up and reciting the pledge? How would you, as an adult, feel free to do that? And then you come back and you try to tell me that a third grader feels free to do that. We're going to take a break.
and we're back. And we're coming right back to the Clown Award, our other reg regular weekly feature, which is given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. And, oh, do we have gold medal material this time. True championship form. The winner of the Big Red Nose this week is right-wing political operative Grover Norquist. Now, you know about Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton's paramour back in 1998, uh, leading to the whole investigation, impeachment, blah, 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 and broglio. You also know about her recent article in Vanity Fair in which she talked about the uh, Vanity Fair, that is, in which she talked about the affair, saying she was speaking out now because, quoting her, I turned 40 last year and it's time to stop tiptoeing around my past. Well, of course, in response to this, the right wing reacted as it always does. It was instantly chock-a-block with conspiracy theories, mostly revolving around how this is somehow to protect Hillary Clinton as she prepares for an expected 2016 run for president. For example, Lynn Cheney, wife of the big Dick Cheney, uh, suggested that the Clintons may have pushed Lewinsky to speak out now so that any rehash of 1998 will be old news by the time of the primaries, as if it wasn't already. But Grover Norquist, he had a different idea. Quoting him now, this is the same trick the Clintons pulled on us back in 98. We didn't campaign against the massive overspending or anything else. We were distracted by this bright, shiny object they handed out, which was Monica Lewinsky. It'll be the same this time. That is, Grover Norquist is claiming that the entire Clinton-Lewinsky scandal with the months of attacks, dodges, and humiliations, with all the months of supposed investigator Kenneth Starr giving new meaning to the term Star Chamber with his ever-increasing claims of authority and lurid obsessions with stained dresses, with the impeachment of Bill Clinton and his trial before the Senate, that all of this was actually a plot by the Clintons to keep the goppers from campaigning against liberal overspending in the 1998 off-year congressional elections. Seriously. And I tell you, that has got to be about the stupidest piece of so-called political analysis that I have ever heard in my life. Grover Norquist, you have become the new definition of clown. All right, now on to something else. Um, we call it the little thing. This is where some something that's basically mentioned in passing in some article news item is uh, actually very revealing or contains something important that is not getting the attention it deserves. There are some marches and rallies in Seattle uh, for May Day. Now, after they were over in the evening of that day, there were some incidents. This is how AP reported the day. This is the opening paragraph of its coverage, and I'm quoting it in full. Police fired pepper spray and arrested a half dozen people Thursday night as anti-capitalist marchers meandered through Seattle hours after hundreds of peaceful demonstrators took part in a May Day march in support of immigrant rights and a boost in the minimum wage. Okay, note first that while the day's main march was mentioned, the actual lead was about all the trouble that happened in the evening afterwards. The article then goes on for eight paragraphs about the evening incidents, about violence at past protests in Seattle, and about threats of violence at this one. It then devotes a grand total of three sentences to what it called the earlier boisterous rally, two of which sentences referred to a quote from a participant before it rounded out its coverage with reports about vandalism and about a threat to kill Seattle police. Okay, here's the point. Here's the little thing. In the middle of this article, the AP says, again, and I'm quoting, Violence has plagued May Day in Seattle during the past two years, with protesters challenging police in the streets and sometimes stealing the thunder of much larger daytime events. And whose fault was that? Whose fault is it that a relative handful of people who fantasize that vandalism is an appropriate political tactic can steal the thunder from a much larger, boisterous, but peaceful rally? Who made the decision to emphasize one over the other? Who made the decision that this is more important than that? Who decided to give most of the attention to some black-clad prima donnas over those actually offering some substance? 
And it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't. And in its article about the day, a local paper, the Seattle Times, focused on the top about the large daytime events, then reported on the evening clashes, and then wrapped up by referring back to the daytime events. The exact opposite of what AP did. But the Seattle Times is a local paper, and the AP, the Associated Press, is a national wire service, which means that most people who read, uh, read about this, most people around the country who read about the events will get their image, their distorted image of the events of what happened in Seattle from the AP, not the Seattle Times. And that image will not be about immigrant rights and raising the minimum wage. It'll be about spray-painted walls, burning trash cans, broken windows, and threats to kill police. And whose fault is that? Whose fault is that that will be the image many people have of May Day in Seattle? We are, by our national media, by our corporate media, we are uninformed, malinformed, and misinformed. When it comes to actual issues that we as a people, as a nation, face, we Americans are among the worst informed, the most uninformed in the entire industrialized world. Because this, this is hardly the only example. Years ago, a friend told me that she wasn't worried about media monopolies because she said, I think what I think, not what I'm told to think. And I said, well, that's true. The media cannot control what you think. But for anything beyond your personal experience, the media has a major influence on what you think about, on what is important, and of greater impact, influence on what's important about what's important. What are the features, the factors, the, 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 the elements of those stories that deserve greater attention? Now, I'm going to be talking more about this in the future because this obviously is, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, there are lots of ways in which the media fails us. But today, I'm just going to mention just one of them. It's what you might call the never-ending debate. Part of the reason a handful of loudmouths romanticizing vandalism as revolutionary gets the attention of the media is because the media loves drama. Closer related to that is the fact that the media loves controversy. Media would much rather report on the controversy than on the dull, settled facts. Not only does it sell better, it's just more fun. What's more, by engaging in a journalistic version of he said, she said, reporters can tell themselves that it proves they're independent, they're unbiased, because they told both sides, even though by treating both sides as equals, they are creating the bias that there's actually a debate. That's why, for one example, the media keeps giving respectful attention to proponents of so-called intelligent design and other varieties of creationism, rather than just saying evolution is real, the theory of evolution has overwhelming proof, the creationist alternatives are debunked nonsense, and there is no genuine scientific controversy about it. Now that's not the only reason, that media failure is not the only reason, but it is a notable part of the reason why in a recent poll, um, only 31% of respondents said that they were extremely or very confident that living things, including people, had evolved by natural selection. Now, whether or not you as an individual accept the reality of evolution is probably not going to have a major impact on the world at large. But another finding in that same survey could. Only 33% were extremely or very confident in the reality of human-caused global warming. 37% were not too or not at all confident in that, which is even worse than the 25% who, according to Gallup, uh, are labeled solidly skeptical about global warming, with only 39% confirmed believers. Now, if you want to, you can chalk up a good portion of the determined ignorance about climate change to ideological rigidity and narrow-mindedness. But if you think that the media constantly preventing global warming as controversial, as the subject of a debate, of a, as, as a question, if you think that the media does not bear significant responsibility for the fact that only two-fifths of Americans accept the scientific reality, a reality that, if ignored, if not acted on, will have a major impact on our lives and on our futures, if you think that, then you just have not been paying attention to the little things. 
especially because the damage from global warming, uh, the damage from climate change is not something coming in the future. It's here now. The most recent U.S. Uh, climate assessment, released May 6th, points that out in very stark terms. It lays out how every region of the country is already seeing the effects of climate change. In fact, it begins to sound biblical in its impact. The assessment reports heat waves, more extreme precipitation events, coastal flooding from sea level rise and storm surge, increased risks of extreme events like hurricanes, decreased water availability, f droughts, floods, shrinking glaciers, thawing permafrost, leading to wildfires, disruption of agriculture, decreased food and water security, and damaged infrastructure causing what it called far-reaching ecological and socioeconomic consequences, perhaps particularly for Alaska. Alaska Native communities whose lives have already been seriously disrupted by global climate change and whose lives are going to be disrupted even more. The report says, depending upon how hard we work to contain the warming, temperatures could go up anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 2.8 to 5.6 degrees Celsius, by the end of the century which would mean it's predicting that we already are going to bust through the limit of an increase of 2 degrees Celsius in average temperature, which is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, says is the most temperatures should increase if we're to avoid truly serious consequences. The assess this assessment, by the way, is the result of two years of work. It was written by more than 250 scientists, academics, and government officials overseen by a 60-member panel called the National Climate Assessment and Development Advisory Committee. They held 70 workshops around the country. Uh, they revised the final drafts to include thousands of public comments and had their work twice reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences. And, of course, none of that mattered to the nanny nanny naysayers of the right wing who dismiss the report as anything from political to some kind of plot to destroy the greatness that is America. Because those people would rather send their children and grandchildren into an ecological Armageddon than to admit that they were wrong or worse have to stop sucking at the teat of such as the Koch brothers and the rest of those who get rich by polluting our world. And by the way, this report has also come out right around the same time that scientists have confirmed that glacial melt in Antarctica has reached a point of no return. That even at this point, even if we stop putting any more fossil fuels into the atmosphere, if we stop putting any more um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, those glaciers are going to melt. We have passed the point of no return. You've got to realize that in a lot of these issues, and a lot of environmental issues, there is just that. There's a point of no return when it is too late. And we are already approaching that too late in too many ways. We are setting our, our children, our grandchildren, and even ourselves now up for disaster if we do not act now. There's a lot more that needs to be said about this. A lot more I wanted to say about a lot of things, but I am out of time. So you just have the best week you possibly can. I will see you next week. And for now, peace.